Hey everyone, welcome to Heaven Awaits. If this is your first time checking this channel out, I'm glad to have you here. My name is Lee, and I narrate the near-death experiences of those who have died and have seen the other side. My videos are meant to show people that there is indeed life after death. If you enjoyed these videos, please consider hitting those like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified of new content. Doing so is free, and it does help the channel grow. To my return viewers, welcome back. Sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee or tea, and enjoy today's narration. Today's experiences, that's right I said experiences, come to us from IANS. There are four total experiences. As I state later in the video, I wanted to sort of make up for not doing videos for a few days due to illness. Each of these experiences is different in its own right. As such I will not be offering a synopsis this time around. While being sedated for knee surgery, something went wrong with the anesthesia causing me to go into cardiac arrest. I remember feeling very cold and then very quickly feeling free, carefree, and curious. I was watching the nurses and anesthesiologists talk and work on me from a corner of the OR. The only bright light was the bank of lights in the operating theater. I watched for what seemed like 5 to 10 minutes, but what was more likely less than a minute. I felt like I was being kept inside the OR, though I was curious about what was outside. Then with no voice nor instruction, I felt it was time to go back down to the table and let them see I was okay. I have had no fear of death since then. The next morning, the anesthesiologist came to talk to me to tell me I gave her quite a scare. I had seen her at work and knew how she had reacted. I had very pleasant feelings towards her. I pretended I knew nothing of the event. The experience made me seriously question my religious belief and gave me the impression that my soul is eternal. I told no one about the experience until two years ago, when I confided in someone very special to me. After the experience, I have closely watched and listened to others who have had similar experiences and have always felt that mine was somehow incomplete in that I was not attracted to any bright light, nor down a corridor or tunnel. I heard no voices and saw no one. I knew it affected me spiritually, but others have had more complete experiences. Moving on to our second experience. I had only been married for a short time and was not wanting any more children at the time. I had a daughter from another marriage. I had an IUD in order to prevent getting pregnant. During the night, I woke up very ill and with a high fever. I remember going into the bathroom and passing out. When I came to, my husband was standing over me. I was in the bed and he was screaming at me and telling me to wake up. He was very scared and later told me he knew I had died. I remember floating out of my body toward a bright and beautiful light, feeling such wonderful peace, and then I heard a beautiful voice ask me, Do you want to stay or go back? I answered. Go back to take care of my daughter. Then I was awake and saw my husband standing over me, scared beyond words. The ambulance attendants came later and took me to the hospital. I was in the hospital for 10 days and had a severe infection from the IUD. I never forgot that NDE experience and told no one for years. Sometime later, I got pregnant and had a baby boy. His father and I divorced and I was granted custody of my son. In the summer of 1989, I let him go stay with his dad and while riding his bike, my son was hit and killed instantly. I was out fishing when I saw the sheriff and some friends driving up. I knew right then before they arrived that it was for me that they were coming to tell me something about my children. The sheriff told me that my son had died and how. It was very bad. The minute I was told about his death and the circumstances, I had some sort of peace, knowing how death was peaceful, serene, and glorious. That is the only reason I probably did not completely lose my mind from knowing the circumstances of his death. I have since related this story to a magazine, Maybe Life, years ago, when they did a study about NDS. I have talked to many groups of parents since then that have also lost children and can tell them about my experience in hopes of giving them some comfort. I do not mind if you tell my story in the hopes that it can help others. I think I have described all the details that I can remember and as accurately as I can remember. This is one thing I do know. I will never doubt that this was a true experience and that strange things like this do happen. Why me? I do not know. 
I do know that because of the different things my son had said to me as he was growing up, I sometimes suspected that he was not going to stay long on the earth. I would tell myself I was crazy and would forget about it or at least try to. One thing that I did do because of this experience, my uncle was dying a very painful and horrible death. I stood at his bedside and talked to him, telling him to go ahead and cross over, that it was okay and he would be at peace. He died right then and looked very peaceful. A nurse was with us and she witnessed this experience. Thanks and hope this can be of some use to you. That does it for our second experience, moving into our third experience. I will try to be as brief as possible. In June of 1991, I was bitten by a brown recluse spider and I was hospitalized the day after and treatment began. I proved to be allergic to the medication used and my condition worsened. I started massive hemorrhaging and was transferred to another facility, which was better equipped to handle the situation. I was placed in medical ICU and transfusions were started to replace the lost blood. I was in a coma during this time. I was not aware of being moved to another hospital until awakening five days later. At some point during this time, I found myself crossing a bridge. I seemed to be leaving an area of darkness, and the bridge led to a place of brilliant white light. On reaching the halfway point of the bridge, I observed a group of people in white clothing, possibly robes, who seemed to be engaged in a discussion of some sort. They were bathed in this white light, which seemed to have no particular source. Everything on the light side of the bridge seemed to have a glow about it. As I paused on the bridge, one of the people looked up at me. I recognized him as a man I had met about three years prior. He held up his hand as if wishing me to stop my approach. He stepped away from the group who continued their activity, whatever it might have been. The man did not approach, but spoke to me and told me that my work was not complete and that I must return for a time. At some point after this, I regained consciousness. My wife told me that the doctors were considering stopping my heart and putting me on life support to give my body a chance to rest. They were afraid I would exhaust all possibilities of surviving if this were not done. Before they could proceed, I began to show improvement. This came within minutes of the procedure being started. I was eventually moved to a room where I could have visitors. Two friends of mine who were mutually acquainted with the person I had seen informed me of his death, which had occurred a few days before I was hospitalized. Since he lived in another state, there had been no communication between us for at least two years. I was unaware of his death until they told me about it. Moving on to our final experience. After the fireworks show on July 4, 2002, my wife, who was pregnant and not feeling well, and I returned home. Just before she retired to the bedroom to go to sleep, she reminded me to take my Prozac, as I had been bad about not taking it in the past weeks. I did as she requested, then went to our family room to watch some television. Some time passed, and I realized that my wife had fallen asleep. I decided to walk down our neighborhood street to see if some friends were having a party. Highly likely since most Friday and Saturday nights weren't a party at their home. There were several new faces at the party, and most were under the influence of illicit substances. It appeared that I had some catching up to do, and the beer had run dry. I have only ever used illicit substances on two occasions— this particular night and one night about a month preceding same person's home, both during parties, both times, just pot. It wasn't long before the pipe made its way to me. I decided that if I was going to stay, I had to join in so I took my first hit. The party went pretty much as parties go, jokes, talk of buying more beer, horsing around, etc. From what I can remember, the pipe made its way to me between two and five times. At some point, one of the guys rolled a joint, and I took two or three drags of it. Next came the invitation to go inside for hits off the bong and mixed drinks. Someone mixed up a rum and coke for me while I used the bathroom. I got lucky to get a seat at the table, as several folks were standing. While I drank, the bong made its way to me two or three times. The last time, I took a very large drag, and wound up having a coughing fit afterward. As the last hit had its effects on me, I sat looking at the faces around the room, I noticed that I hadn't moved my entire body for quite some time, only looking around with my eyes. 
I decided it would be fun to see how long it would be before someone noticed that I hadn't moved so much time had passed without being noticed that eventually I worried that I couldn't move. With that, I made an effort and got up. It couldn't have been three minutes after I stood up that the party all of a sudden ended. I felt worried that I wasn't going to be able to make it home, only living six inch houses down the well-lit street. I finally mustered the courage to walk home, but only after the last folks left. My walk home was uneventful. I made it okay enough. I walked upstairs to the family room, removed my belongings from my pockets, undressed, and laid myself in a reclining chair to go to sleep. As I lay in the chair, I felt as if everything that I did required deliberate action, even breathing. I decided that before I closed my eyes to sleep, that a prayer was in order, so I proceeded to say, Our Father. While saying my prayer, I either fell asleep or passed away, I am not sure which. I remember saying, Lord forgive me for I have sinned, over and over. Eventually, I realized that these words were not part of the Our Father prayer, so I tried to stop, and I couldn't. I could only keep repeating, Lord forgive me for I have sinned, in a pathetic tone over and over and over and over. After what seemed like repeating this phrase several hundred or a thousand times, I feared that I was dead. All around me was pitch darkness. I felt as if I was swimming endlessly upwards and if I was being constricted. All the time, Lord forgive me for I have sinned. Lord forgive me for I have sinned, I thought of my family. This wasn't how I wanted to die. I thought about my pregnant wife and my two children, who were visiting grandparents in another state. Oh, how it saddened me to think of these things. My next conclusion was that I was in purgatory, a place that isn't heaven nor hell, but where souls go to be punished for their sins before being let into heaven. As this thought sunk in, I started to deliberately change the tone of my speech. Lord forgive me for I have sinned. The more I thought about God and faith and my family the more passionate I became in my efforts of saying, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. During this entire time, I kept thinking about my family, about how I hadn't seen my children in two weeks. Although I couldn't change what I said, I had control over my thoughts. As I was yelling with fierce anger and passion, I yelled as loud as I could, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. And for a split second, I saw an orange-yellowish light, and I woke up in the chair, still yelling at the top of my lungs, the phrase I had repeated what seemed like millions or billions of times. After yelling three or four more times, I realized that I was standing in the darkness of our family room. I stopped yelling and asked, Alicia, are you awake? From the bedroom in a sleepy slash irritable voice, yes. Have you heard what I've been saying? Yes, God forgive me for I have sinned. You were yelling it. Why were you yelling it? From here, I proceeded to explain the night's events and my dream slash experience to her. As I explained to her, I felt as if the words I said were not controlled by myself. I felt an urgency to talk, and all she wanted to do was sleep. She told me over and over that I was frightening her and to let her sleep. I didn't want to frighten her but felt as though I must keep talking. I asked about calling our priest, and she mentioned that there was a mass at 9 in the morning, and I could talk to him then. That wasn't acceptable. I had to keep talking. She suggested that I call my sister on the West Coast, a source of religious advice, most of the time unwanted. I exclaimed, that's a good idea. I sought out the phone. Changing my actions seemed deliberate, and my body felt as though it badly wanted to rest, but I feared that I would surely perish if I didn't stay awake. I used the phone to redial her number. My sister's husband answered the phone, where I proceeded to tell my entire story again. I kept them on the phone for two or three hours, sometimes yelling, sometimes crying, all the time praising the Lord and insisting that I had been granted a special grace by God. At some point, I concluded that the only reason that I was alive was because I asked for a second chance. I still felt as though my words and actions were not being controlled by myself. At the time, I was positive that God was speaking through me. Looking back at the situation, it's possible, perhaps likely, that the drugs controlled my actions. There's a whole lot more to the story, but the significant parts have all been mentioned. The events that followed included the police, an ambulance and fire crew, a trip to the hospital, and a trip to the psychiatric emergency room. 
I was released on the 5th at 2.30 p.m. after being determined to be sane. The doctor that examined me concluded that the pot must have been laced with something. That does it for our final experience. I know that this video was a bit different, but I wanted to do something special since I have been sick. I am truly interested in hearing what you guys thought in the comment section below. Until the next video, stay safe and be blessed.